we've been uh, going through the book of Matthew. We're now in chapter 2. Uh, the title of today's message is, It's Always Darkest Before the Day Dawneth. And we can see in our world right now, we're in dark times, and we probably think that it's, it's pretty bad. But it can get a lot worse. And I think we can probably admit that, that it probably could get a lot worse. But even at the same time, we can see that it is dark times. And the phrase, it's always darkest before the day dawneth, comes from, and it's attributed to, a Puritan by the name of Thomas Fuller, who was a contemporary of John Bunyan. And then for those of you who know who John Bunyan is, he was the one that wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And where did he write Pilgrim's Promise from? He wrote it when he was in Bedford Jail in England. And why was he in jail? He was in prison for preaching um, at illegal church meetings, according to the Church of England. And he was in prison for, um, for, was in 1661 for three months initially. And when they were getting ready to release him, he, he refused to assure the authorities that he wasn't going to do that anymore. And so he stayed in prison because he said he was going to continue preaching. He stayed in prison for another 12 years. And with that time, he, one of the books that he wrote was Pilgrim's Progress. It was certainly dark times for Thomas Fuller, for John Bunyan, and other Puritans of that age. When you Would it be illegal to preach at certain places and certain times? They knew these hard times. They knew dark times. And that's when Thomas Fuller penned the quote, It's always darkest before the day dawneth. And the passage we're going to be looking at today is one that is often overlooked in the Christmas story. Uh, so often when we read the Christmas story out of Matthew, we, we stop right after the Magi were warned in a dream by God to go back to, to not go back to Herod, but to go home by a different route. And so we like to keep this Christmas story all neat and tidy and not have too many scary things put in it. And who wants to scar the minds of our kids with the murder of many of infant boys and adults for that matter? With, and this is, um, it was a tragic event when babies, boys that were two years older and younger were slaughtered in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas. And because it includes the surrounding areas, not just Bethlehem, it probably included quite a few more than just a handful. It was probably maybe more like 50, 60 young children that were young boys that were slaughtered. But this is part of Matthew's gospel. He put it in here for a reason. He didn't just put it in throwaway verses. There's no such thing as throwaway verses in God's holy and errant word. They're all there for us, for our benefit. And one of the, two of the things that it does is it shows us the depravity of Herod. And it also shows us the providential hand of God and how he worked. And it also gives us hope in the midst of darkness. And you, we might be saying, well, how does it do that? And when we read the passage, we'll, we'll see that. But what we think, one of the things that we're going to see is, is we're going to be seeing four things in this passage. We're going to be understanding the trickery of the Magi. We're going to be understanding the rage of Herod, the scope of that rage, and then the hope in the midst of the darkness of the prophecy being fulfilled. And when we read this passage, we're going to be reading starting from Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. When, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping, and great mourning, 
Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So far the reading of God's wonderful and holy word. When we see our first point, I, I titled it The Trickery of the Magi. And the reason why I did that is because I want us to almost change that. And so I want us to think about it in a different way. Because when I was looking this up in the original languages and different translations, the word mockery was also used. There was no real trickery on the part of the Magi. They didn't plan to deceive Herod in the first place. It was because the angel of the Lord told them in a dream to go home a different way. And so we say, well, well, what's the, the word then to be used? The word mockery is probably a better word to use. And why is that? It's because they didn't heed Herod's authority or his wishes. They did not give him the his due when he says, yes, I would like to go worship the child. Now, obviously, being magi, when they got to Jerusalem, they did not know the despicableness of Herod. And so he was able to get away with saying, yeah, I'd like to go worship the, the, the king child at this time after you do. So come back and let me know where it's at. They didn't know that, but the Lord informed them in, in a dream. But they did not take his desire to worship seriously. And they went home by another way. What they did do was they heeded the word of God that came to them in a dream. They obeyed that but they mocked Herod's request. And, and so that's the word that I would like to use in that place. But the thing we also need to take a look at is we have to understand he became enraged. And we go, okay, yeah, he became enraged. I really believe that Herod was a madman. I believe that he was on the verge of paranoia in many ways. He was a man that was, was very evil. And we're going to be getting into that. But remember when Herod first heard the wise men that were there in Jerusalem, he got all the Pharisees and the Sadducees together and he said, tell me about this. Where is this going to take place? So he acquired information from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then he calls the Magi secretly and then he makes a bargain. He goes, I've got some information and I'll give you some information if you give me your information. They gave him the time of the, the star appearing. He gave them the location. And so he is being calculated and cunning when he does this. And so he, when, when that bargain is all of a sudden just disappeared, then he becomes thoroughly all the more enraged. And it says, and he sent and slew all the male victim who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. One of the things that we do know is, is that he was, like I said, we're, we're going to learn about Herod and about his evilness that he had. He was satanic. He was depraved in such a way that when we see what he did in his lifetime, it's just despicable. I, I, I found this one article and talked a lot about how, what are some of the things that he did. He was crowned king of the Jews in the Roman Senate in 40 BC in Rome. He was, however, a king without a kingdom. And upon his return to the land of Israel, he was given a Roman army and eventually able to capture Jerusalem. The first order of business was to eliminate his Hasmonean predecessors. And so Mattathias Antagonus was executed in the help, with the help of Mark Antony. He had the elderly John Hyrcanus II strangled over an alleged plot to overthrow him. And Herod continued to purge the Hasmonean family. And uh, this, he eliminated his own brother-in-law, who was high priest. He was 18 years old at the time. He was drowned in 35 BC by Herod's men in the, in the swimming pool in the winter palace of Jericho, because Herod thought that the Romans would favor him as ruler of Judah instead of him. <clears throat> and then he also had his mother-in-law, Alexandra, killed his wife executed. He even killed his second wife as well. 
She was his beloved Hasmonean bride whom he loved to death, no pun intended. Um, in around 20 BC, he set up an internal spy network and he eliminated people that were suspected of revolt. Herod also had three of his own children, his own sons killed. And they were, it says that the, the first two, Alexander and Aristobulus, the sons of Miriam, were strangled in Samaria. The last only five days before his own death, when Antipor was buried without even a ceremony. Herod the Great was extremely paranoid during the last four years of his life. On one occasion in 7 BC, he had 300 military leaders executed. <clears throat> On another, he had a number of Pharisees executed. Um, and the one reason why they were executed because there was they were prophesying that part of his family would overthrow him and take over the government. So with prophecies like that circulating around the kingdom, it is no wonder that Herod wanted to eliminate this newborn king, baby Jesus, when the wise men revealed the king of the Jews had been born. And so Herod, he did not really, he was not after Jesus because he was the Messiah. He's just a power-hungry, bloodthirsty, paranoid, mad king. That's who he was. You could put him in the same class even as Hitler, I think, in a lot of ways. But one of the things we have to understand is Herod and Hitler have the same depravity in us coming from Adam. The, the main difference here that we see is, is that unchecked power puts depravity in complete display. It magnifies it. We've heard that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that is what takes place in this case. And this showed so much went from killing so many family members, the Pharisees, different soldiers, his wife, his, wow, this guy was a madman. He was just a downright despicable person. And with that being said, I mean, this all sounds like a very, very dark time for the Jews. In our world, there are what we call dark providential times. And this is one of them for them. And this was a really some of the darkest of times for them. They had 400 years of silence from prophets speaking to them. They had been subjugated to Roman rule and not just Roman rule, but under this evil puppet king, Herod. But out of this comes the first glimmer of dawn, that first morning light with the prophecy that is being fulfilled. And Matthew tells us Jeremiah prophesied of this event in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, where we read, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Now, remember the last few weeks I've talked about Matthew. He doesn't just say this is fulfilled in just this one verse. It's a pointer to the whole passage around it that Matthew wants us to look at, not just at that singular verse. He doesn't want us to look at that verse alone in isolation. He wants the reader to remember the whole story of Jeremiah 31. And in fact, the whole story from Jeremiah 30 all the way to 33, because commentators, when you look at the book of Jeremiah, it's divided up into sections or books. Jeremiah 30 through 33 is often called the book of consolation because Jeremiah is prophesying that they will go into um, exile. And when they, there's not a whole lot of comfort found up until this, this, these chapters, these four chapters. And uh, it, it, in these four chapters, it gives expression to hopes for the future rather than judgment that's been characterized in all the previous chapters and chapters 1 through 29 in, Je in Jeremiah. So this, this section here has themes of restoration and hope restored in this passage. And it also has this climax in chapter 31, because what is, what, what is given to us in chapter 31? 
the, the, it's the prophecy of a new and better covenant. That covenant which we today enjoy as Christians, as God's people. And in the midst of this, right before the new covenant, is guess which one, what verse? The verse that Matthew quotes. He quotes this passage because, yes, there was great mourning in Jeremiah's time. There would be great mourning because as they would travel off to, into exile, they would be going past Ramah. And the mother of, of all the, of the people of Hebrew, which is commonly referred to as Rachel, she was in great mourning at that time. And that's what Jeremiah is speaking about. But he's also prophesying of this event that took place. <clears throat> in Jeremiah 30, I want to back up a bit and say that the Lord is assuring his people that he will restore them. He's sending them off to exile, but he is going to restore them. Because he says in chapter 30, For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord. I will bring them back to the land I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of them. And the Lord also shows uh, his, his promise to renew this covenant relationship in, in verse 22 of chapter 30. He says, You shall be my people, and I will be your God. In Jeremiah 31 contains probably the, one of the most significant prophecies of the Old Testament. And that's what I was talking about before. The promise of that new covenant. And that's the light that shines in that darkness. But let's, I want to, before we get into the new covenant, I want to give us a, a summary of, of chapter 31. The, the first six verses of Jeremiah, verse, the verses, chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. It begins the chapter by describing Israel's captivity using the images of their wilderness wanderings before they got to Israel, before they got to Palestine in the first place. And then in verses 7 through 14, he celebrates the coming restoration of Israel in her homeland. <clears throat> and then the verse that Matthew mentions, Jeremiah uses the imagery again of Rachel weeping for her children to describe that grief as they are going into exile. But Matthew nor Jeremiah uh, leaves us there in that morning. Because in the next section, we read that the promised restoration of Israel means the end of Rachel's mourning, the end of her mourning. There's hope for the future, declares the Lord, and your children will come back to their own country. And that's in verse 17 of Jeremiah 31. Then another promise of restoration in verses 23 to 26. Jeremiah speaks of the days of, of the days to come. And he uses in that passage, in, in that section in verse 28, he uses six words that is mentioned right at the beginning of Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 10. And what does he say? He says, And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, bring harm, I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. He doesn't leave them in exile. He has plans because they are his people and he loves them. But the most fundamental teachings through found in the prophets that were before the exile is that Israel has failed miserably to keep that old covenant. And because of that, judgment is coming. So the history of Israel from the time of Moses coming into the land of Israel all up to this, pre that, this present time is a history of continual disobedience and apostasy. So how is, but now that that exile is coming, God is promising restoration. Well, how is that going to happen? How is that restoration going to happen? And how does this relate to Matthew? Matthew wants to remind the readers to read beyond Rachel's sadness and to look and to remember the context of that passage because the right coming after that is the new covenant. And that's what he's talking about, that the end of Rachel's mourning is near. 
And then it's immediately following that Matthew quotes, he says, because Jeremiah now brings in the nature of this new covenant. And I'm going to read that. It's in verses 31 through 34. We read that in our opening this morning. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is that new covenant that we have a blessing of. This is us. This is God's people in a new covenant relationship with him. He continues on, he says, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. Then, get this, the God of all glory speaks forgiveness into our lives. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is a tipping point in Jeremiah. This is a turning point in the Hebrew life. And this concept of this new covenant it is found elsewhere in the prophets. But there's a special term here that he uses in this passage that's only found here, here when he says this word new covenant. It's berit hadasherah. And this is such an important thing for us to understand, this new covenant. And I probably butchered the Hebrew, but even so, this is a very special covenant, this new covenant that Jeremiah speaks of. And Matthew wants us to see that here this prophecy is fulfilled with a richer and fuller meaning then Rachel weeping because what do we understand? Her weeping and her mourning will come to an end. A new covenant will be made with those who broke their old covenant. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And you know what? God, what is that saying? God himself will make the necessary changes within the hearts of his people so that they can obey. So back in verse 34, this profound promise that I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. That's one of the most profound promises of this covenant, that I will forgive their sins and remember their iniquity, their sin no more. And then after this whole covenant, God says, my bond is with you is permanent as permanent as the created order. Now, what do I mean by that? As, as permanent as this creation is, is the permanence of his promise. Because he says in verses 35 of 37 of Jeremiah 31, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order de departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all they have done. God declares the permanency of this covenant by likening it to the permanence of creation. And this promise is worthy to take note of because this is stated in so absolute, unconditional terms. For those facing the, prosper, the, the prospects of 70 years of exile, because that's where they're headed. They're headed off to 70 years of exile. But when they hear this, they have hope. 
It's a source of great hope for Israel. And Matthew wants to bring that hope to us by reminding them, the reader, of this new covenant in Christ Jesus that's coming. So even in the darkest hours of Israel's history, Matthew does not leave them with the misery of death of these, child, of these children. He leaves them with a promise of a new covenant relationship, of a new heart, of forgiveness of our sins forever. Later, God speaks to, to Jeremiah in chapter 32, and he says of us, the people of the new covenant, and he says, Behold, I will gather them out of the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. They shall be my people and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart, one way that they may fear me always for their own good, for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. This is great comfort. And I know in, in the world that we live in, we see dark times and we're wondering what's coming. Well, I can tell you the Lord is going to be coming one day soon. We don't know. We don't know when. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. But we do know we win in the end. We do know that we have the gospel, his good news. We know we have forgiveness of sins. Because what does it say when we read earlier in Matthew? His name will be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It doesn't say he is going to save them from the Romans. It doesn't say he'll save them from the Russians. Doesn't say he's going to save him from the commies. He says he's going to save us from our sins. And that's the point he wants us to understand. That when Jesus brings that new covenant in, that we can take that covenant and we can share it. We can give it to other people. We can win this world through the Lord Jesus Christ with the gospel. That's the, the, the beauty of what we have learned today. Besides the fact that, yes, there was great mourning in the land because of the loss of children's lives. But Matthew says, but look back what happened in Jeremiah. Yes, there was great mourning. But yes, there's great hope for us. We have forgiveness of sins. We have hope of everlasting joy with the Lord Jesus Christ. With the dawn of redeeming grace. And that's one of my favorite um, Christmas hymns where it speaks of when it says the dawn of redeeming grace, the first morning light. And that is for us, Christ's new covenant of grace and mercy. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for what Matthew does in the midst of great trial and tribulation that he points them to this new covenant, which is really our one and only hope in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you sent your son to save us from our sins, to die on the cross and to rise again from the dead. And now you are in heaven advocating for us every day. We thank you for that. And we pray that one day we will be with you. And we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given to us in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.